Hello everyone, I'm back for another video. It's all about alter theory or alterism. So I will talk about that and I have an example of a director that's an alter and there are disadvantages to it as well and why people don't really agree with it as such or they criticise it. Even though it's not really talked about now, it was a big topic back in the 60s and 70s, but I'll get into that more detail in when we get into the video now. So what is alter theory? So basically the word alter is the word, it's a French word for author, and it's described, it could be defined as a director who represents the creation of author in a film, whether it is a signature style, whether they have a signature style that they consistently use and a particular thing that they use in the narrative of their films. So <clears throat> there are so many, you could recognise their work, that's what this means. So through the way they use their there are filmmaking methods which influence their production, which they have for influence, including writing, acting and editing. But that can't be always can't really be the case, but sometimes it depends how they incorporate it and what they do with it as well. And how they can continuously present their style on screen. And you will be able to recognise aspects of their work. like through the use of writers, a particular writer or particular actors or the editing style, like if they like to use a lot of jump cuts or if they like to exaggerate their editing or use certain camera work and framing or music or they use music as a way to distinctly or a specific kind of music that makes them makes the audience feel something like maybe they use music for suspense purposes or for comedic purposes whatever so Cahir du Cinema which is the leading film magazine at the time in France which made criticisms of many cinematic movements and the discussion of La Politique de Auteur named the Alter Theory which is renamed to the author theory by Andrew Saris, who I think he published a lot of essays about it as well. I don't know if he's alive now or he passed away, I can't remember. So a lot of film enthusiasts, Andre Bazin and Francois Truffaut, were leading film critics from the magazine. And they even, I think it runs so too far, I think he directed his own film as well. And Andre Bazin, he, I think he used the alter theory as a, he wrote essays about different things like realism in cinema and cinema that's happening during the Second World War and after it as well. I think he died young. Apparently, I think. I think he was in his mid mid 40s or so. I can't remember how old he was. So he wrote, I mean, Truffaut had written a manifesto on Uncertain Tendance du Cinema Francois. So in his that manifesto, he praises those filmmakers who are able to write their own dialogue and in some cases invent their own stories because he's praised them for being the true alters. So he characterises them as the true alters. These directors as the true alters, meaning that they are instrumental for that production they are very influential in terms of their production 
to directors who are auteurs and other directors. So despite American films being studied in depth, there are some controversy as to uh, over that some directors are really branded are deserving of being true auteurs or if they are mature the answer which is means the scene setters or they just set the scene and just direct a film and that's all they do is direct so Wallen Peter Wallen he's a film critic or essayist and a professor I think he's a professor as well states that Truffaut does not see the meta answer as anything beyond the realm of a performance because they don't have anything, any involvement in the other processes that writing, mise-en-scene, cinema, cinematography, sound, they don't have a style or purpose. So he's stating that they don't follow consistent themes, style or purpose across their films. It means that they don't, they're not really deserving of that. He doesn't think they deserve to be called alters because they don't follow it. The theme, they don't really have anything that they use. They don't have any distinct quality that makes us recognise their work. So directors... Your auteurs tend to have influence in the production from development stage to the filmmaking process until the editing and exhibition phase of the film and the distribution to multiple cinema chains across and even through DVDs or streaming services, however the directors choose to make their films. So directors... He only direct, they don't really have a lot of impact in terms of how the script in is formed. The script making process is formed and the storyboarding of the film. They're just there to direct their film only. They're only made to direct. They're not made for anything. They don't, I think it's because they lack, it could be partly because they lack experience or they never been on the actual film set themselves and learnt how the industry works on set from bottom to top. They don't really know much because there's some directors who make their own films and they never, ever worked on set. They just directed. I don't know how they do it. Maybe they went to film school. Maybe they, they've been shadowing, but they don't really have that proper experience in terms of knowing how productions really work from development to distribution phases. So there are three components to the altar theory, of the altar theory. So Andrew Saris, as we mentioned earlier, as I mentioned, I was supposed to say, he's the critic for the New York Times. He says to divide divide Truffaut's writings into three main components, which can define the author. So technical competence, distinguishable personality, and interior meaning. So so technical competence is authors who need to craft their style with their technical and filmmaking abilities. So these directors always have a way to let the audience know that it's their work. So we don't really need to say, who is this director that's done this work? They're, you instantly recognise through style with Alfred Hitchcock, Martin Scorsese, Spike Lee, whoever you recognise. You don't need a second invitation. You don't need to even research their name. So alters have a hand in multiple aspects of filmmaking and they operate at the highest level. And every aspect 
from beginning to end, from writing, development, coming up with their own ideas as well. That could mean that they are influential in their production. They have a hold on it. So distinguishable personality is what separates the alters from gifted directors is obviously is called personality and style. You can see that they actually put some effort into their own work to make sure that it's their brand of filmmaking and it's the way that you want to tell their stories. I think this is more to do with story and the other one is to do with more style and incorporating certain elements like the mise-en-scene, the cinematography, sound, editing, whatever. And this is more about personality if their stories and the use of actors match up so they explore consistently with a certain film technique, like symmetrical film framing, like Wes Anderson's work does, and the use of particular themes, like or genres, like thriller, psychological thrillers, like Alfred Hitchcock, he uses that type of genre in his films, and they use particular themes in their narratives, like lonely nurse or they relate back to their selves they're able to always make the film unmistakably theirs and the audience are able to recognize it and they know what they know how to bring it back to their relate back to themselves basically like whether it's to do with their childhood or memory that they could constantly recall or if they dreamed of something that embeds that they could actually remember or they used to have nightmares when they were younger I don't know it could be those things and this is a sharp contrast to studio directors who could only translate their vision their creative vision from the script to put on screen so they don't really present their own visual style they don't actually have a distinct voice basically which is what Andrew Cyrus is trying to say. Because they need to, have, you need to have a distinctive voice. Because otherwise, how are you going to present? If you're that director that's only doing that, how are you going to present your work? How are you going to show people that it's your personality? It's your take on that story. What are you going to do about it? So interior meaning, so it has layers of meaning that's implied, hence why they have more say over the human condition. So films by authors have more impact than just entertainment being their main purpose, because entertainment is obviously the main purpose. But there are many ways that the audience could ref- feel so we can relate to the filmmaker basically so they use their own experiences to of life and they put it in their films like having a father figure in their life or something to do with constantly exploring what feminism or womanhood really is or whatever or having or something to do with their upbringing there is you just have to add to make sure people can relate to you so influence in world cinema so after the collapse of the studio system so more and more films are independent films are being made meaning filmmakers have more creative film freedom so they can direct write their own films and They write stories that are true to them itself rather than following what the studio demands of them, like typecasting or working on shoots and not allowing and restricting creativity, basically. That's what the studio system was actually doing to a lot of filmmakers. They were actually restricting the way the directors created and the way they thought about their films and what stories they want to use. So these films went against the grain 
of Hollywood, which is very light-hearted, very flowy, and all that. Very, yeah, they basically had this romanticism about it. And they try, they actually discard that and by adding darker themes to their films, which have nuanced ways of portraying stories that otherwise would never be told. So it could be from their experience, from their perspective, or some. Like I said, it has interior meaning, and they're able to add their own personal style, and they're able to experiment with different techniques, filming techniques, basically. So in France, Truffaut's ideas have be- gave rise to the French New Wave cinema, which included a lot of directors like Jean-Luc Luc Godard, who wrote, he directed Breathless, Agnes Varda, Jean Cleo, The Five oh, Arts so if I'm sorry, I'm not good at French. It's not really translated. That's not what I'm trying to say. In the US, Alter Fairy spawned into a new generation of filmmakers so they can explore stories and direct films in the mould of French filmmakers. Alter, so they are inspired by the French new wave, which is why they're able to incorporate it in their films. And tell stories that otherwise not will not be told, and they use scenes that otherwise will never be used, basically. So, including Arthur Penn, Mike Nichols, Stuart Rosenberg, who are the maybe the one of the main ones, but there's others. So these young American directors would be part of what would be called become known as New Hollywood, which, and I said they were inspired by the French New Wave. And they were embracing new tropes and techniques of that. So as you could tell, you could see two distinct styles. They're both very similar in terms of the look, but I think obviously the grayscale, but it's still because there has the natural, naturalistic feel to it as well and both stories have been told in such a way that nobody were able was able to do at the time and they now have a lot of freedom creatively and visually and a lot of creative freedom I'm trying to say okay. so Tim Burton has a particular style and genre that he uses in his films so they could be considered as Burton-esque so he is an author who's known for his visual style <laughs> inspired by the art movements called German Expressionism as you know that is a style within itself that uses a lot of ex- hor- gloomy places like graveyards haunted houses and distorted buildings, which is how the the mise-en-scene of German Expressionism is incorporated. So it has a Gothic feel to it. So these things represent, these represent things that have been out of place, which is always the case in Burton's films. So he likes the, he loves the unconventional and he's able to fit it within his films. So meaning that it fits under the category of the fantasy genre. So he's able to incorporate characters that one would not usually find in situations that never occur in the real world. So he's always using, he's always thinking outside the box. He always has a way of doing that. So for example, you will not find a ghost who wants to marry a human in real life. Because that is mad. That is mad. If you see that. If you tell me. Because he uses that as a way to tell stories in his films. So, or nor would, nor would you come across a resurrected dog. And someone who's able to chop hedges with his scissor hands. So, 
His films are quite quirky because that's how... I think it's quite part, part of his personality also, I guess. So they explore concepts that will, could never exist in the real world since his films are particularly fantasy. Audiences could come to expect that quirky, unusual stories that are when they film will come to expect quirkiness and unusual stories that are told through that when a film is associated with him they're able to expect that however even though these feature things do not exist in real life films that have the theme are very human and relatable because there's a video about his childhood it reflects back, reflects back to ex- his experiences. Like, as, I, as you can see, these German expressionism, there's a film, I think it's called Dr. Caligari or something, that uses that style very well and it's very prominent in the film. And this is Burton's artwork and he's able to incorporate that. That's the inspiration. So his films are more kids, family friendly, but scary at the same time. If you were to ask me. One of my favorite directors who is often cited as an auteur is Tim Burton. Burton was born in 1958 and was pretty much an outcast amongst his peers. He made stop motion films in his backyard during his preteen years, which left a pretty big impact on him given his future. Burton's first short film was a stop motion titled Vincent. The short features the titular young boy who idolizes and likes to pretend to be Vincent Price, who also narrates the short. The short is somewhat autobiographical on Burton himself, as the titular character hides away in a world of gloom and darkness. In his review of Nightmare Before Christmas, James Rolfe of Cinemassacre calls Vincent the quintessential Tim Burton film because it defined his dark imagination. Which brings me to my next point. What exactly makes Burton an auteur? There are quite a number of traits that a majority of Burton's filmography have in common although some of his films share more or less traits than others. The trait that all of his films share are are dark slash gothic visuals and mise-en-scene. The settings range from distorted buildings from Halloween Town to Beetlejuice's graveyard and invasion to the mortal world, and there's more to go as well. The guy can make bright colors disturbing, believe me. Mizan-sen also is uh, used in his films in the form of snake up. Another use of Mizan-sen in his films are dogs. His animated films will all feature an undead dog inspired by the death of his own dog, such as Zero from Nightmare Before Christmas, Sparky from Frankenweenie, and Scraps from Corpse Bride. A common story element in Burton's films is having the main protagonist be a misfit or outcast to society, connecting, of course, to his childhood. The character Edward Scissorhands is a perfect example given how he's treated for having, you know. Jack Skellington, while not an outcast as being the king of Halloween Town, can be considered an outsider when he arrives in Christmas Town. Isolation is another character trait. For example, Willy Wonka keeps himself isolated inside of this chocolate factory once he starts to lose the trust of everyone else. So you can see that Tim Burton's able to use interior meaning basically about his childhood. He uses the theme of isolation quite often in his films, as you can see in this film, this clip here. And he's used animation as a way to tell stories and to incorporate his style. Even though he's done live action, he likes to... He started out as an illustrator and he uses mise-en-scene like makeup, for example, to make the characters look exaggerated 
And that's why he likes the unconventional. And you can see he's incorporated every part of his films to look more exaggerated. And he uses bright colours as a way to make things look disturbing. And so he makes family friendly films horrifying, basically. And that's how he's able to incorporate that in all his films. And he, it's basically about his childhood as well, like being an outcast and all that. One of my favorite. Okay, sorry. There was an image before that. Okay, sorry, I'm back. So Tim Burton, he, for his, for himself, he expresses himself through the visual arts because of his short film called Vincent, which he made an animation. I think it's part of a student project. And it was about a young boy living in the suburbs who really likes gothic horror stories and pretended to be Vincent Price, who's actually the narrator of the film, as you heard in the documentary, the video essay. And the film represents a semi-biographical depiction of his own childhood because he grew up watching horror films with monsters and ghosts that are normally misunderstood. And that's how he felt about society because society never understood him and the way he thinks, the way he likes the unusual. He's, he feels like he's unconventional in those m- many ways. He's actually able to use that positively, which translates into his films. And him being an alter, having a background in animation and his unusual style of drawing that's distinct to him. And these characters include Jack Skellington in The Nightmare Before Christmas. Even though he did direct them, he had influence over the way the characters are meant to look. Victor Van Dort in Court Brides, if you ever watched that film. Sparky the Dog in Frank Weenie, which is quite an unusual film actually. Danny Elfman, he uses Danny Elfman as the main composer for his scores film scores, which produces the kind of music the director, which suits his favourite, which suits his film and making style, I meant. Which suits the way he makes the films. And you can see these drawings. They're very drawn in a very unusual way. I think he's able to visualise what he wants in the film. Even though the Edward Scissorhands, it looks like an animation, but he's able to incorporate the style of clothes and the way the person looks through makeup, the costume, the set as well. So he has a filmmaking style which gives the audience perspective of how he sees the world. So in the film has a mixture of fairy tale. It's a fairy tale film with a mixture of life experiences, which obviously you saw in the clip. It's it's, it's basically about Tim Burton himself being an outsider among his peers. And he employs the theme of loneliness, innocence and darkness in his films. And the films represent how he views society and how people are and how critical they can be about other people. So, because people are very nasty in general, really. And Edwards, the main character, does not conform to society because everybody is the same, because they all like to live in a very colourful worlds and he's all wearing black and making him an outsider. He may seem intimidating the way he wears. People think that's very intimidating because he's wearing all black, but 
his personality is very gentle and he's very shy and calming around people. So the setting for the film is the in the suburbs and people know one another and each house have has so many different colours but they're eerily identical because of the green hedges and wiggly driveways and meaning that individuals are always acting as if they need to be the same like they have to fit in they have to conform to fit in which makes them less that's a bit creepy because you need to have your own identity and he has his own identity through his hands and Tim Burton's able to project that in the film because you could tell that's how he wants it to be and he, how he wants how he viewed life basically and it's based on his life experiences he frankly collaborates with Johnny Depp and Helena Bonham Carter who normally keeps their own individuality so they're able to, he's able to find these actors because they're able to give him the type of style the type of kind of acting that he likes basically they like to become weird in the films and experiment with their styles and stuff so there's issues with alterism as we all could tell we know he's an alter Burton's an alter but there's issues about it so the topic of authorship has been long debated topic because among scholars and film critics since the 1930s so this began when the question this began when questions the questions began when they start to arise about whether cinema is really an art form or commodity because cinema is seen as the seventh art and people argue that it's not really art if you're collaborating with others and there's one director that put it bluntly i think it's john carpenter and he put it bluntly that cinema is an art that it's a collaborative art form and i believe so also that's what i believe I think the director has influence still, but you ha- need other people. You can't make a film by yourself. So it's a collaborative art form because you're using others to help you. With a fine art or dance or spoken words, that you could do on your own. But with cinema, you cannot do it on your own. That's why people say it's the seventh art, because it's long debated as such, whether it's an art for more commodity. So developments of semiotics was established in the beginning of the 20th century by, as we all know, Ferdinand de Saussure. He's the founder, one of the founders of the idea of semiotics. So it was a discipline that dispersed into two proportions of studying in films in terms of film study and pop, popular culture and all that so the signifier which is the language term the signified which is the object or the concept slash concept so the idea was unknown until the 1950s when Roland Barthes wrote an essay myth mythologies making the semiotics theory popular which is why there's so many issues with the also theory because it's how the audience interprets the film you know and i'll get to that shortly so one aspect of the alterism is because it is um anyway is that the director versus the screenwriter so critics have long debated about his views and gifts. They feel like it gives too much credit to the director, not just for the screenwriter. Because the screenwriter is truly the old auteur in this case. And film critic Pauline Kell 
she criticizes uh, Andrew Saris's magazine. So she criticizes his essays and she wrote an essay about it called Brazen King, which she had disputed. Orson Welles as an author, there's a film about that as well, called Mank. If you haven't seen it on Netflix, it's David Fincher film called Mank. And it came out like a couple years ago. And my teacher was talking about it. The lecturer was talking about it at university. And he said that there were arguments, disputes. It does dispute old Orson Welles as an author, whether he really had any input because he relied so much on his crew that he relied on Herman J. Mankiewicz, which is basically about his life in the film, about him writing Citizen Kane, because it was based on his experience, not Orson Welles's. He just acted in the film and directed it. That's what he did. And I don't really agree that he is I, it does dispute. I think there's more leaning towards that he's not an alter, in my humble opinion, because he only directed and acted. He did. He's more of a the metteur de scène, which is based the scene setter, basically. He's basically the scene setter because he's relying on other people to help him with that. And cinema Greg Toland to produce the film Citizen Kane because he's the one who created all these shots. Wells just told him what to do and how to film it. He just didn't really have any input to it. So there are other critics, including Richard Corliss and David Kippen, who both argued the film's success came down to the screenwriting. Hence describer theory, meaning the writer is the principal author. And I dis- that's why I said, if you watch the film very carefully, Mank, you will see that that's the case with this theory. That is the case that they're trying to dispute. They argue it in the film. It's clearly said in the film. If you watch it very well, you will know that it clearly displays displaces Wells as an author because he's not the author. He's not really the true author. He never really had that much input into it. He just hurried him up and told him that he needs to get that film made. So, the film is a very good film, Citizen Kane, but there are aspects of it which have grey areas. So, so here is a video that I found about the scriber theory. So how did this happen in a town? Ta- so how did this happen in a town called Hollywood, where we thought we were all about filmmaking and caring about writers and all of that? Few directors are as fair as John Carpenter, who basically said, it's a collaborative effort. All I take credit for is the directing. That's the kind of guy we need more of. (laughs) We don't have enough of that. The problem was I blame France, not to insult anyone who might be here from France. (laughs) But it was, in fact, Francois Truffaut. uh, Early in his career as a film reviewer, he came up with what we call the auteur theory which told us that directors were the auteur, the author, the writer of the film. And that was the end of that. From that point on, that's how people referenced films. And this is a deep problem. Uh, he was writing for this, uh, Cahiers du Cinema, and this is where the author theory, auteur theory was born. To me, the biggest mistake ever made. I like the fact she disputes that. She disagrees with the theory. Because there are grey areas to it. Directors can't always be the altar. John Carpenter's is right. He just does the directing. That's what the director's there to do. Because the writer's there to write. It's their idea that we're trying to portray on screen. That they're trying to portray on screen. It's not... if Unless the director writes their own scripts, then we could say that they are an altar. And it, there is... There is problems with that. You know... 
And I just, I do agree with what she's saying as well. So, issues with alterism, the death of the altar. So, alternatively, film critics have a deconstructivist, deconstructionist or textual analysis to the altar theory, finding there is an issue surrounding it. So they immediately believe that there's the meaning should be excavated from the film itself or the viewer in response. So basically it's all about the audience, basically, what we think of the film, how we interpret the film, and whether we like the film, and what we think the film needs. So the audience has more input now. So it's birth of the reader now. So when you say death of the author, it's the birth of the reader, basically. So these issues, despite the issues, Altafair is still popular approach to film analysis, but has grey areas into it. So directorial influence and artistry continues to fascinate viewers and critics. So for Roland Barthes, who says in his essay, Mythologies, which is about this topic here, the death of the author is the birth of the reader which basically is to signify and is signified. The signifier is the author and the signified is the reader. Basically, they have more interpretation now. It just switches them around. Their roles have changed, basically. The roles have changed. So by this, Bartos is saying that the author is not the authoritative figure of the text. So meaning that it doesn't reside with the author's intent, but it's the reader's interpretation of what they think the text is about. So it's a bit like what the film is about, basically. It's, the director could put the film out there, but it's depending on the audience and what they think the film's about or what they, how they view the film and what themes they see in the film. There's no right or wrong answer when it comes to art, really. That's what he's saying. So the case of structuralism is problematic, which had de-romanticised. So you hear the word de-romanticised, the auteur. So it's less folk. So there's con. It causes the contest to be less focused on the filmmaker's product, which is their film, basically. The film that they've made. <laughs> because they don't really have a lot of input into their film anymore. Once it's distributed and it's been seen by millions of people. Then. They don't have a lot of control over that, you know. It's up to the audience now. What they think and what needs to be improved on. And all of that stuff. So alter structuralism. Focuses on the hidden sources and codes behind the text, which acknowledges the question of how text came to be single was unnecessary. So it's all about the audience now. We are in power now. We're the authoritative figure because we know that we're the signifier now. We are going to interpret the film. We're going to watch that film. It's what we think now. We have a say on what they're trying to portray. It can mean a lot of things to people, whether they relate to the film or they don't, you know. So there's an example of this, where this case has happened. Blade Runner 2049, Dennis Villeneuve's long-awaited sequel to Ridley Scott's masterpiece, Blade Runner, has opened to rave reviews across the board with an 89% fresh rating on the reviews aggregator Rotten Tomatoes. Critics have called it mesmerising to behold, a film that is spectacular enough to win over new generations of viewers, yet the rare sequel that truly merits its existence. 
Although the film's themes can be appreciated by a newcomer, many will wish to watch the original, either for the first time or as a refresher before feasting upon the sequel. However, with multiple versions of Blade Runner available, this isn't as easy a proposition as it would first seem. Welcome to Final Frontier, so which version of Blade Runner should you see before watching its sequel? There are eight versions of the 1982 cult hit film, including a nearly four hour long early cut shown only to studio personnel. These versions include two different director's cuts and several different endings. For those new to the film, the short answer to the question is, watch the final cut. This is Ridley Scott's definitive vision of the film, one in which he had complete control and it was also mentioned by Denis Villeneuve as one of the versions he was inspired by. Although he admitted that the original US theoretical release was the version he first saw and fell in love with. So what are the other versions of Blade Runner? The work print version was shown to audiences as test previews in the US in March 1982. Negative responses to these previews resulted in the studio making various modifications for its subsequent US theatrical release. This version did not have an opening title sequence and crawl explaining the backstory of the replicants but instead opened with a definition for replicants describing them as synthetic humans with paraphysical capabilities having skin, flesh, culture. There was also no unicorn daydream sequence, which would be a key addition to the director's cut and the final cut. There is also a different shot of the ending as Deckard watches Roy Batty die with alternate narration. I watched them die all night. It was a long, slow thing, and he fought it all the way. He never whimpered, and he never quit. He took all the time he had as though he loved life very much. Every second of it, even the pain. Then he was dead. There is also no happy ending. The film ends when the lift doors close as Descartes and Rachel leave. The work print version would inadvertently be released in 1990 and 91, marketed as a director's cut without the approval of director Ridley Scott. A San Diego sneak preview was shown only once in May 1982. This version was nearly identical to the 1982 US theatrical version, except that it included three additional scenes not shown before or since. The US theatrical version, known as the original version or domestic cut, added a voiceover narrative by Harrison Ford after test audience members indicated difficulties in understanding the film, making this cut feel more like a neo-noir detective film. The studio also added a happy ending, with an additional scene showing Deckard and Rachel happily driving away from Los Angeles. Gaff had been there and let her live. Four years, he figured. He was wrong. Tyrell had told me Rachel was special. No termination date. Perhaps more importantly, the original theatrical release had no unicorn dream sequence, thus never calling into question whether Deckard is human or a replicant. The international cut, also known as the Criterion Edition, or uncut version, is similar to the US theatrical release, but has more violence in three specific scenes, which were later inserted into the final cut. The US broadcut version was the US theatrical version edited by television company CBS to tone down violence, profanity and nudity to meet broadcasting restrictions. This version is preceded by a teaser explaining that Descartes is not a replicant and the initial text call at the start of the film is read by an anonymous announcer with slightly different text. So you see, this film had many versions of it. Once the film was made, people started, they started to watch. That means the studio executives were the auteurs because they want to see the final product go out. It wanted, they want the film to do well, but they had to keep making changes all the time to suit the needs of the director or the standard that the director wants. But he doesn't really have a lot of control over that anymore. The Ridley Scott, he doesn't have a lot of control over it anymore because it's up to the others editors and post-production crew to make different versions of the film with an acceptance to the newer Blade Runner 2049 film made by Denis Villeneuve 
I grew to love his work, so. It's not really my favourite film, but I'm saying that. It happened to, and there's another film that had this issue. I think it was the Justice League, but and then the first one was pretty terrible. And then once the version that the director wanted, the director's cut made the hit, basically. It was a hit. It was a hit. The second time round. The director had more of a say because I think sometimes the I think the problem is that the studio tends to have more control. That happens very often in Hollywood. In a lot of major broadcasting companies and distribution companies that they tend to have more control over what how the film should be because they had issues i think the director there what's his name for justice league is zach schneider i think and he had i think it's a lot of studio interference i think that's the same with blade runner why ridley scott was not able to make the film that he wants to make and the film had performed poorly in the box office in the past he never had a lot of control over it and the studio interference is the main issue I think most directors do find themselves in that position that, the ones I've been hearing about like like I said about Zack Schneider I think that's why he made his own cut director's cut and it turned out to be a success a cult, a cult classic basically and the same with Blade Runner it's a lot of people started studying the film I'm talking about it, excuse me, in the, in the classrooms and univers- academic places and stuff. Blade Runner 2049, Dennis Villeneuve's long away to see. Blade Runner 2049, Dennis Villeneuve. So, the issues of alterism, there's feminism. So from a feminist point of view, they say that the Alter Fairy seems to only include male directors, according to Maria Geis in 2013. So it could explain, this could be the reason why there's a lack of female directors in a lot of big productions, because we don't really know. We don't really know much about them, and they only are an independent film. I think because a lot of Production companies are very discriminatory. They discriminate against women in film because we don't. They don't think that women are capable of directing huge budget films, and they only prefer men. And I wrote an essay about it when I was in university, like last year. So in two thousand sixteen, there are only seven percent of female directors that worked on the top. 250 highest grossing films, which is a pretty appalling, especially now, that time, during that time, the Me Too movement starts to become prominent and speaking that up. The women are trying to speak up about how they were treated in the workplace and what some of the top male executives, producing executives were doing and they were abusing their power and all that. And they have less of a say during that time until the Me Too movement movement and the Time's Up campaign was up, basically, because even actors, female actors, were getting paid less than their co-stars, even though they were doing the same bloody film as them. It's crazy, you know. And we're still talking about, they say, oh, it's changed. Moving forward, we're progressing. But it's not really changing, is it? We'll be having to have the same discussion all the time. And it's now it's still the same case because not many women were nominated this year, I think. And there's lack of diversity across the board. And... In terms of the Oscars and no female director was, I don't think they were ever nominated for an Oscar. 
No, this year, I think there was a male director that was won the Oscar for Best Director, which is a disgrace, really, and a BAFTA as well. So the director's role in a production has changed as more women are using their voices to demonstrate good leadership because they have more freedom in what they need, they want to create, basically. That's why. The celluloid ceiling reports were founded and constructed by Martha M. Lawson. He's a P- he has a PhD who PhD in San Diego State University. The reports analyzes the women employees in Hollywood since nineteen ninety eight, mostly being behind the scene roles. So they basically use collect data from that time. Women working in Hollywood based on the all the behind the scene roles from producing, directing to the bottom part of it, maybe like sound or post production, or runners or data wranglers or whatever. So the evidence have shown that only sixteen percent of women are directing the top grossing films in two thousand and twenty, up by twelve percent, up to twelve percent in two thousand nineteen, four in two thousand. 4% in 2018, and this was for the top grossing films who were working on these films. So women were accounted for 18%, an improvement by 13% in 2019, which is an 8% in 2018. So this data was published in 2021. And 2022 must have changed by now. It must have gone up. It should have gone up. Because women are supposed to have a say now. And they say that we have a say in what we do. And, the type. and we're becoming more vocal and we're leading, paving the way. They're paving the way for future directors. Like female directors. And allowing them creative freedom. So the film industry has been interrupted by the pandemic so because we had COVID-19 and all the regulations were set by the government, governments, wherever you are, around the world. So the decrease of theatrical releases and the increase of home viewing, mainly through streaming services such as Netflix and Disney Plus and Amazon Prime, because... That's when online stuff became more popular because there's. I think they have to rethink the way they market their films and how these films will be distributed because no one's going to go to the cinema during the pandemic unless you live in the cinema, but there's no chance of us doing that. Or unless you have a home that has a cinema, but that's still going to be on the streaming platforms because I think. It's changing the way we watch TV as well. And it's the same thing, you know. And they're using these online platforms as a way to publish their films. So how would it measure up from the previous percentages? Because, as we mentioned, each time is getting... It's slow. The numbers are not really that high, or they don't really... That prominent, you know, because it's slowly going up. So, the percentage of, I mean, I read that already, sorry. Yeah, uh, the percentage of women directors working in the top 250 grossing films has decreased by a single percentage since 2020 um, for the top 100 grossing films. Is by four percent. It went low by four percent, which is why we still have men dominating the industry. They're able to make their own personal projects, and that the indie product projects that they want to direct, while they can work on huge, massive budget films, 
The women were only restricted to our own projects, the indie ones, instead of the ones that they want to pursue, which is the big budget ones. Maybe, what would we have to do? And only three directors have won an Oscar in the past, since the inauguration. Three female directors have won an Oscar. That's an absolute disgrace, in my opinion. And the lack of diversity in this year's Oscars is pretty terrible, really. I just can't bear it, you know. It breaks my heart to say that. I know I have, I'm not supposed to give an opinion, but it does break my heart. It's upsetting because we work so hard. They work so hard and they don't get the critical acclaim they deserve. And that's why the alter theory is very biased towards women. And I have a film example. For so long, men had all of the jobs of power. And now, slowly, as the old guard is dying off, you're seeing this equality emerging. My name is Janine sherman Berois, and I am the writer and director of French Fries. Being a woman in the TV industry is hard as hell. It's difficult, um, and you need as many people around you supporting your career. You know, so often it's so hard to get anything done, to get the resources, and so to have Shatterbox, Refinery29, and TNT come together and finance these films so that we, we could actually tell a story that we wanted to tell, I think it's important. I really wanted to get females behind the scenes. And so all of these women sort of came together and said, let's like kind of help each other and uplift each other. I used to go into casting and people would say, am I reading with you? And I'd be like, no, I'm actually the boss. They're not used to having women that look like me be the ones that are behind the money, behind the creative decisions, behind the casting. But now people are realizing that the narratives cannot just be told from a male point of view. And women are no longer being quiet about it. If I could give a young woman advice in this industry, I'd tell them just do your story, direct your movie. Don't wait for anybody to give you permission because the more voices that we have of women out there, the broader appeal all of our narratives will be. That's basically true. Everything she said is what I've been saying because you can't be silent about this. You have to put yourself out there. You can't behind hide anymore we can't hide anymore you have to go out there and make your films stay motivated i could talk but it's about preaching it you practice what you preach basically that's basically the point that she's making and they're not used to seeing people like her or other female directors that are the boss basically you're working for them I'm currently working for a male director right now as a location marshal and I do want to work for a female someday who has great stories for their films. Put your own creative spin on it. You don't need to wait for anybody to tell you to make a film. You could go and do it yourself. You just need to ask people to help you, whether it's a man. And she recruited all women in her crew and that's fantastic to see because she's trying to make a change the only change you're going to make is if you imply that change across the board so behind the scenes these women are able to make a film together and that's why it depends on who you want to include i know there's race and all that there's a diversity just find the right people and find the right crew. If you want to include all women in your film, that's absolutely fine. If you want to include men, males, and if you want to include disabled people, LGBTQ plus people, and whoever, or people from the global majority, that's absolutely fine. It's your production at the end of the day. 
You include who you want to include. Make the film you want to create. As long as you have a message. And you imply the author theory, if you're going to do that. But there are issues with that. Barriers. That's all I have to say. You just need to imply, apply what you keep doing, what you're doing. Make the films happen for yourself. Produce the film you want to produce. So that's it for this video. So if you enjoy and like, please subscribe and comment for more stuff and share with your friends. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.